I guess as I was thinking about this talk and today, um, I, I actually was thinking about it while I was trying to help my twin fourth graders prepare for their spelling test. And they're in a magnet program. So the way they do spelling is they're actually doing Greek and Latin root words and then learning those as a way to, to learn spelling. And it's humbling as a, <laughs> an adult with college graduate education to realize how few of those I really know. Uh, but in, in thinking about sustainability, I think that's how I think about it. I really go back to the Root. I mean, sustainability has taken on sort of a, a term of art, or it, it's become a, something of a brand in, in a way of meaning a certain kind of product or a certain kind of approach. But really what sustainability is ultimately about is something that can be sustained, which means that the resource use can be replenished. But it also means that it's practical, it's feasible, people want it, people will continue to do it. Um, and so I think that's a lot of what we have to think about as a utility in thinking about how do, we, how do we prepare for the way our customers need and want to use energy? How do we bring our customers along to a way of using energy and thinking about energy that is sustainable and that will be adopted by the mass of our customers and not just the the most fervent and evangelist in, in the group. So that, that's sort of to set up how we're thinking about this. Now is this good? Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, so I need both of my notes in there. So the key, we think, really is about collaboration and integration. Uh, it's going to really require a range, considering a whole range of issues, and I think all of the people on the panel have brought up a lot of the things that we're thinking about. So it really it comes back to economics, it's thinking about air quality, safety, reliability, affordability, energy independence, competitiveness for the businesses that we serve, matching supply and demand, and ultimately the probability of success. And I think all of the speakers that have come before me have touched on some of these. Um, as we look at it, the as an energy supplier, what we recognize is no one energy source is going to meet all of those issues. And we really need to be developing a portfolio of options that are going to work interdependently across all of these uses and needs to achieve the, the goals that we've set. So I want to talk a little bit about our energy source, which is natural gas. And just to Think about what natural gas can really do. Natural gas can heat your home, it can heat your water, it can dry your clothes, it can fuel your car, it can cook your food, and it does that at a fraction of the cost of other sources and with a smaller environmental impact. Natural gas can also be a renewable resource and it can be seamlessly blended as both a fossil and renewable source. So there's a lot of flexibility that's really being brought to the table. right past. Other thing I want to make sure is really clear, we, <laughs> this is our favorite little picture here, but um, nearly half of the electricity consumed in California is generated mm -hmm. using natural gas. So when you're talking about electricity, you're really still talking about natural gas. Mm -hmm. It's also the primary fuel source for heating homes and heating water. More than 90% of homes in Southern California use natural gas for water and space heating. So the way we use energy today, natural gas is embedded. Um, it's really the fuel of choice at this point nationally for new electric power plants. And uh, it's also the primary source of fuel for distributed generation systems. Huge growth in solar, that's fantastic. Solar as a reliable and continuous energy source depends on support from natural gas fueled sources at this moment. That's continuing to evolve. That's a wonderful thing, um, but we're we're the we're behind the power that actually drives what's happening. Um, natural gas is also very affordable, and I think that's a really important consideration as we're trying to push that envelope. If you think about your gas bill versus your electric bill for a minute. The annual operating cost for an electric water heater is two and a half times the cost for a natural gas water heater. In practical terms, natural gas is the most affordable solution for these uses for a long time to come. Natural gas vehicles, 
Natural gas actually for vehicle fuel costs on average 42% less than diesel fuel on an equivalent energy basis, and by 2035 we expect it to cost 50% less. According, that's according to the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Agency. Right now a gallon of CNG is half the price per equivalent gallon of gasoline. So as a transportation fuel there is huge potential for natural gas. It's also vastly cleaner as a transportation fuel. The, the major benefit of natural gas is it's very efficient. It loses very little in the delivery from its source to its end use. So as, as a comparison, as electricity travels through power lines, some of the power is lost, only really 26 to 38 percent of the power of the energy content of the original fuel source is actually delivered to be used as electricity. And by comparison, 92 percent of the energy content of natural gas is actually available as energy when it gets to your house and is used as energy for heating your home and heating your water. So that efficiency is a hugely valuable asset when you're talking about something that can be sustained. So let's talk about what we do to persuade our customers to use less of our product. It is amazingly difficult to get people to accept money to not use your product. <laughs> you would think that would be the easiest sales job ever, but it's actually pretty hard. <laughs> so we offer comprehensive energy efficiency programs, and what those programs are really doing is trying to help people understand how much energy they're using, trying to help people understand options, and getting people to adopt technologies that are maybe unproven, that may become obsolete, that are more expensive than the standard efficiency. Um, and, and to think about, for, in particular for our industrial customers, to think about redesigning, re-engineering their process to use less energy all the way through the process. Not just at the start, at maybe there's a boiler or a, a burner or a furnace or something at the start of the process, but maybe that's going all the way through a manufacturing process. Well, let's follow that energy all the way through and bring down the energy use. We also have, so we've offered $105 million in rebates and incentives to our business customers since 2006. We have a lot of money away. It's still amazingly difficult. <laughs> um, and I've talked a little, we do assessments, we provide, and we provide programs across all of our customer classes, residential, commercial, industrial, local government, education. Uh, we have programs targeted specifically at lower income customers to make it very easy to reduce their energy use. And then we also have an R&D group, which is spearheading development and refinement of efficient technologies and advanced technologies, and that includes solar water heaters. We actually have uh, a demonstration at our facility in Downey of a solar thermal air conditioning system. This is one of those counterintuitive things that a lot of people don't realize, but if you have heat, then you can cool. So first, if you, if you create the heat, you can then use that heat to, to remove the heat from the air, and I'm not an engineer, so that's as far as I go. But it is really there, and you can come look at it any time. It's a solar air conditioning system that's using a solar thermal system, which is much higher efficiency than a solar photovoltaic to electricity to air conditioning. Um, so we're very excited that that has a lot of potential to really reduce energy use and to um, really enhance the reach of what we can do with photovoltaics by pulling some of the really thermal energy load to a more efficient um, system. So now I'm going to talk about some of our practical projects. So this is not the beautiful building, and boy, I always get building envy when I see this slide. <laughs> and, I, and I go visit some of these gorgeous headquarters of these sustainability-oriented uh, places. And, and in play, and in or and higher education and organizations like that, where they can, they definitely uh, higher education is one of the key sectors that is really trying to push the envelope in demonstrating sustainability. But I think that in some ways it's easy for them because it's part of their brand. It's part of how they sell their product, which is bringing students to them. It's something that their customers care about, and so it comes to them. But our projects tend to be underground inside, not that pretty, but they save a lot of money <laughs> and they save a lot of energy. So this is a project that we've done with UC Irvine and this kind of highlights a lot of what we've done. So what this actually was is they had an old central system that had sort of been idled and abandoned. They weren't fully utilizing it. Our folks went in and said, 
you've got the ability here where you could use your central system and you could be cooling and heating through multiple buildings with this system and reduce your total energy use by using your waste heat coming off of a central boiler to be doing the work for multiple buildings. And what they did in this, they took advantage of multiple offerings. One of the things they did is we have a, a program called on-bill financing. And what that is, is a zero interest loan where the energy savings are actually paying for the cost of the loan. So we set it up where the payment on the loan is equivalent to our estimate of what your energy savings are going to be. So your gas bill stays the same, but you're actually using less gas, and then you're paying over time for your investment. It means no upfront capital investment. And for institutional customers like the UCs, we can loan up to a million dollars, which is what we loan to UC Irvine. So this means that they now have They've extended a high temperature water line to four new health science buildings that were originally built with boilers and water heaters, but now they're using that one central system to hit, heat four different buildings. And it's saved, not that anybody knows what a therm is, but over 400,000 therms a year. It supplies water from the central cogen plant to offset the natural gas consumption. Um, and the cogen plant is actually producing electricity. So you're producing electricity that's fueling the campus, and then you're using the heat that's produced in that process to heat and cool the buildings. Um, this is the single largest project that we've done under our um, institutional partnership, and this is a great example of public and utility funding and using energy efficiency incentives. And then we did another, and this is another one of those, it's not glamorous, it's not sexy, but it works where we did a conversion for their, um, it was a science building, I don't, I don't have exactly which building it was, but this is for air vents that are used in chemical labs where you have to have a certain air removal, particularly when they're working with certain kinds of toxics. Those tend to get run just at a constant high volume to ensure there's enough air moving through it. But the reality is it doesn't have to operate at that level. So we put in a project that could sense when you needed to increase the airflow and when you didn't need to increase, so you're sensing the presence of materials and chemicals that require a higher air volume. And when it's not there, you can bring the air volume down. So that's doing two things, right? One, it's sensing the presence of those chemicals. So it's ensuring a safer, healthier environment. You're giving yourself a backup on your ventilation. But it's also meaning that you're only using the energy when you need to use it. So, um, Here's another one, and this is another one of those simple, practical, it really works, and the more we can do it, the better. Um, this is for Hogue Hospital uh, in Irvine, and this is actually what we call retro commissioning. What retro commissioning is, is, is really about the sick buildings um, that Richard was talking about at the beginning. And, uh, and Heidi also made reference, too, that the operation of buildings will just degrade over time. And so retro commissioning is one of those really simple concepts of let's look at the equipment that's in place and let's get it back up to its original peak operating condition. So as it's coming down, it's less efficient, you're getting more waste, it's not operating as it's supposed to be, you can do low cost things to just bring it back up to where it should be. So we actually did a total of 48 measures that impacted the gas usage and they ranged from things like replacing frozen dampers, lubricating sticky dampers, um, putting an air temperature reset on the air handler units, again, just detecting a temperature so that it's turning on and off when it's needed and not on an automatic cycle, um, reducing your run hours of the air handler, and then just updating and revising your automation system so that it's just better sensing how we're using the building, meeting the conditions that are needed, and not meeting those conditions when it's not needed. Um, so this is actually saving up to 484 tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions over 100,000 therms. And then one last thing, this is an important project um, around trying to meet those equity goals that Heidi was referencing. And this is really about making sure that energy efficiency and sustainability and that kind of building comfort is reaching lower income, affordable housing uh, communities. Multifamily sector is a, is a difficult sector because you've got tenants, you've got owners. Um, it's difficult to deal with the whole building at once because it's not. Oh, it's almost never unoccupied. You've got people moving in and out, and then that whole problem of navigating utility programs. <laughs> this is one where 
we are piloting an uh, approach where we give, we assign a representative to a building owner, building developer, and in this case it's Link Housing, which is a, a large scale affordable housing developer in Southern California. And uh, this is for a property in Santa Ana, and we were actually able to bring in, um, I think it was almost 20 total programs, which does tell me we probably have too many programs, separate problem. <laughs> But we brought in our Energy Savings Assistance Program, which is our no-cost uh, weatherization program. And for every tenant that qualified and met the income standards for the Energy Savings Assistance Program, we went into the units and we're going to be installing things like weather stripping, low-flow shower heads. We have a new measure that's very cool, one of those simple things. It's called a thermostatic shower valve. And what it does is automatically shut your bring your uh, shower down to a trickle once it reaches temperature. So if you're one of those people like me that turns on your shower and then walks around while it's heating up, and then you come back, well, what it will do is as soon as the water gets to temperature, it slows the water flow to a trickle. And then when you're ready to take your shower, you pull a string, comes on full flow. So one of the cool things about that, so simple, really inexpensive. Saves actually a lot of hot water, so water and gas. And also, more comfortable. So um, those are being installed and then what we've done is partnered where there are tenants that don't meet the income qualifications. We're working with the developer to um, help them to, uh, they can bid out to the same contractor to install those measures in the rest of the units. We're bringing in a solar thermal water heating system that's being placed on those units, multifamily, uh, then we're direct installing um, low flow shower heads in all of the units and we're putting in um, we are also uh, updating and putting controllers on their boiler systems to improve the efficiency of the boilers. And then we also did an education program for all of the residents. So we brought together a whole, whole suite of things. And the idea is to make this easier for the customer, to work with the owner, and then we're also trying to work on how we can make uh, financing more readily available and easier um, for those developers. Financing is a very complicated industry <laughs> we're learning, but that's something that we're working on. So what this, these programs have done in this time is one of the things that's not generally well known is that the natural gas sector overall is actually already below 1990 levels for carbon emissions. Um, and that's across all sectors. So that's residential, commercial, industrial, even electric generation. So right now we're, we're done with 2020 goal. We're working on the 2050 goal. Um, and we are actually at a place in natural gas where sustainability is something you can see. We have seen customer growth over 20 years. We continue to see customer growth. We have very strong market penetration. Natural gas is the preferred fuel source. But our use per customer has dropped over 50% in the last 20 years. And we are at a place now where we project, even with customer growth, our net usage is actually on a very slight decline. So it means that we can continue to add customers without increasing consumption. That's a pretty amazing place to be. Now, uh, this is my really cool picture, and I know you all have cow envy. <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit about renewable natural gas because I think this is an important resource that needs to be considered in the portfolio. And renewable natural gas, essentially natural gas is methane. Methane is a byproduct of the breakdown of organic materials. All of our natural gas that we get from the ground, that's just the breakdown of organic materials thousands and millions of years ago. Well, organic materials today break down into methane. <laughs> it's just if they get buried underground, it gets concentrated together. That's a little handier than trying to extract it from above ground. But the methane can be extracted. It can be extracted from food waste, from animal waste, from human waste. Um, it can be captured, it can be cleaned, and once it's cleaned, it's natural gas. It's the same. You can put it in the same pipes, you can use it for the same stuff, you can blend it with natural gas, and it's only the only difference is you know where it came from. You know you didn't pipe it from underground. You know you got it from your trash or your sewage treatment plant. And it's used today. Wastewater treatment plants regularly use 
It's, it's actually a byproduct that naturally happens in the waste treatment process, and then they capture that gas, they use it to generate power, they use it to generate heat. Concentrating it, cleaning it, putting it into pipes can significantly increase the flexibility of the renewable resource portfolio, and it, cre and it adds to and leverages, creates more renewable energy and gives you a flexible source that can be stored, that can be dispatched, and that can be blended with natural gas and used in existing infrastructure. So this is a, a resource that our company has been very focused on trying to help promote and develop in California. I talked a little bit about transportation, just giving you a few statistics on uh, this is a huge opportunity, um, particularly in the heavy duty market, buses, trucks, waste haulers. Natural gas engines have the capability to, um, to perform equivalent to diesel engines today. Electric technology is not there yet. Um, the emissions performance is almost the same. Because remember, the electricity still coming from natural gas, or in Los Angeles, partly coal. So what this all comes back to is teamwork. And one of the things I want to talk to you on the subject of teamwork is um, we have just signed an agreement with the Department of Water and Power to join together our energy efficiency program. So we are going to be partnering with the uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to help jointly market to collaborate on each other's energy efficiency um, and to try to simplify that process. I think that new <coughs> the new commitment from the Department of Water and Power to energy efficiency is going to be hugely helpful. A comprehensive approach across all resources and this will allow us to offer a to offer efficiency solutions for gas, electricity, and water all together, which we think is the first in the nation. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and we, you know, we continue to collaborate with organizations like Breathe LA, like the Air Quality Management District, um, our electric utilities, sustainability designers. It's, we, we look for ideas and we try to support and promote and extend uh, the reach of all of these things to, to help our whole region achieve a greater, more sustainable way of living. So 